So I've been interested for a long time in how images work in society. Can they help people? In recent years, I've written several books on the future of imaging, the digital revolution, and mostly I teach and work in human rights and media. How can media be helpful in terms of helping people around the world? fração do tempo capturada para toda a eternidade. A fotografia trouxe novas maneiras de enxergar o mundo e também mudou ao longo do tempo. De retrato fiel da realidade, ela foi alçada ao status de arte e hoje, na era das redes sociais, está insistentemente presente no nosso dia a dia. O papel da fotografia na sociedade é amplo e polêmico. Entender o poder das imagens na nossa vida é um dos desafios do norte-americano Fred Ritchie. No campo acadêmico, ele é autor de livros sobre o futuro da fotografia e foi o criador do curso de fotojornalismo do Centro Internacional de Fotografia de Nova York, instituto que é referência mundial na prática e estudo das imagens. Uh, I learned how to read with a Life magazine. Uh, the teacher would ask me to cut out a photograph with the letter A that starts with the letter A, like Apple. And that's how I learned how to read. And I, the image has always been really important and direct. Uh, and plus, I, I like people from many countries looking at the same image um, and, and having a similar sense of the world. They, to me, they're opinions, they're ideas. And it's good to see different ideas about different things. Um, But it's, it's, it's kind of like we don't trust our own memory. The photograph is more important. I'd rather trust my memory and the photograph helps, but I don't place it all on the photograph itself. So I'm very suspicious of photographs, but I like them. I think when I grew up in, in the Vietnam War, the photograph, the video, the, the film was incredibly important to understand other places of the world. It, it, you know, if you don't read the language, but you can see the image, you have a sense of what's going on. The photographs of Biafra, of the, the famine, the starvation, for, was very important for me. I wrote a book in 1990, it was called In Our Own Image, The Coming Revolution of Photography. So my fear was that we were going to use photographs kind of like God to change the world in our own image, the way we want it to be. And that's what selfies do. You know, you go to a meal and you photograph the meal, it's more important than what it tastes like. Uh, and I think we're losing an awful lot. We, we have more and more images and they mean less and less. And they're often very, very destructive because People want to do stuff that looks good in the image, not just because it's fun to do. And so uh, I, I think it's, it's, we have to do something about that. Uh, we got a call that people were pinned down, uh, hit by snipers uh, near the Dobrynya Road. Uh, we came up. We found seven people pinned down, one was DOA, two injured, and the arrest run injured was still pinned down by the sniper. Evacuated them all out, we're currently treating the second patient. Em 1996, Fred Ritchie e o fotógrafo francês Giri Perez desenvolveram uma das primeiras experiências em fotojornalismo multimídia. A cobertura era sobre a Bósnia, na época do pós-guerra dos anos 90. A página na internet reunia fotos, além de mapas, textos, áudios e um fórum de discussões. O projeto Bósnia Caminhos Incertos para a Paz foi indicado ao prêmio Pulitzer na categoria Serviço Público. If we can avoid painful things, we try to avoid it. If you don't have to go to the dentist, you don't go to the dentist. So if you don't have to look at images of war, or disaster, you don't look. 
which creates a big problem in, in democracy. It's because we don't know what's going on. Um, and I think people in government are very happy that we look at images of makeup or whatever. We don't pay attention to what's happening. And, you know, it's, it's not a good idea. It's, it's, uh, I think the fact that governments are often getting worse in many countries now is in part because we don't know what's going on. The, the great paradox is there's more information and we know less. There's so much stuff out there that we know less. There's a book by Aldous Huxley called Brave New World. It's the idea that they don't have to censor or ban anything. There's just so much of it that we don't know what's going on. And I think that's where we're at now. There's just so much that we don't know what's happening. So one of the ideas is that I think we have to curate our own work. Like if I was coming to Rio, it'd be great if university students or high school students would curate social media and tell me these are the 50 important images I should know about Rio. That would be great if, if cities around the world, uh, the young people did that. There's so much work to look at, but we never see it. So I arrive at Rio and I have no idea what's happening. But there's so many images, but I don't know, I can't look at four million images. Somebody has to tell me what's important. So if I was a teacher now, I would have my students curating it, their neighborhood, and saying this is what's important on social media. This is what you should look at. It's not expensive to do that. It's, it's cheap. It's, it's, no, it's not a problem of money. It's just a problem of the idea and the energy. Well, we have trillions of images online, but we don't know that. So the argument is that maybe every two or three minutes we make as, as many photographs as the entire 19th century. So they're all there, but we never see them. So I call it metaphotography. Instead of more photographers, we need more curators at this point to do it. Um, but I think it would be really important that people tell us about their own society by curating their images. In a way, it's, you know, it's a great time because everybody could be a producer. Everybody could author their own work. You know, if I publish something on a website, people around the world see it. It's never happened in history. You could do that before, have that kind of impact. But I think we need more thinking about how to do that well. We just don't need more and more images, but we need more intelligence in terms of what we're putting up there. Instead of war photography, I'm interested in peace photography. So in, to prevent war, to prevent bad things. So I showed uh, Gideon Mendel did a project. They didn't want to give money for drugs for people who are HIV positive in Africa. And he showed that they were using them and, and they helped. And the UN sent me an email saying that 8 million people are on treatment today. They're alive today because of those photographs showing that they work, that people do it. It's amazing to be a photographer and 8 million people are alive in, in part because of your work. It's a great feeling. But to me, that's peace photography. It's proactive. You don't wait for people to die and make the pictures. You help them to stay alive and healthy and make the pictures. So to me, that's the renaissance. But that's not what we teach, that's not what we think about. If you go to the library, there's maybe a thousand books on war photography, and maybe one or two on peace photography. It doesn't make sense. We should give the prizes in peace photography, or peace video, or, but not in war video, war photography. We should switch it. Because if it's a revolution in digital and media, we have to think in revolutionary ways. Fred Ritchie foi o curador responsável pela primeira publicação nos Estados Unidos das fotografias do brasileiro Sebastião Salgado. Quando eu cheguei ao porto de esse imenso trou, eu senti derrubar devant moi, a qualquer fração de segundo, a história da humanidade, a história da construção de pirâmides, a tour de Babel, as minas de Rua Salomão. O livro foi lançado em 1990 e revelou ao mundo as faces do garimpo de Serra Pelada. In, in a long time ago, I was the head of photography for the New York Times Sunday Magazine, and I needed somebody to photograph in Brazil. Uh, Pitangui, there was a plastic surgeon. And so I didn't want to use a US or a European photographer. I wanted to work with a Brazilian in Brazil. This is more or less 1980, 79, So I, Magnum gave me the phone number for Sebastião Salgado. So I called him up, I said what I needed. He was at the farm of his father and mother. And he said, mm, fine. 
And the pictures came in, they were fantastic. Their color, everything in a plane, in playing judo, helping poor people, rich people, parties, beautiful women, everything. And I was amazed, he was so good, this photographer. And many, many, a few years later, Sebastian said to me, you know, when you gave me that assignment, a friend of mine told me, you said it was so good. You wanna know what happened? I said, yeah. He said, I did not understand one word you said. I didn't speak English. So everything you said, I go, mm, I did everything. I said, good, we, now we work together. And we worked together and uh, I gave him the assignment when President Reagan was shot, was, they tried to kill him, he was on assignment, he didn't speak English, but I liked his feeling for people. And then we've worked on many projects, and polio, the uncertain grace, many, many projects together. And it's always been important for me that, to work with a Brazilian in Brazil, to work with people, don't send the people, but use the people who know this society and could do what they do. And we're still friends and, uh, you know, and so on. So that's, that's, that's the story. No próximo bloco, Fred Ritchie fala sobre a credibilidade da fotografia na era digital e das diferentes maneiras de enxergar uma imagem. O professor, escritor e curador Fred Ritchie investiga as mudanças da fotografia ao longo do tempo e seus impactos na sociedade. No início dos anos 2000, Fred Ritchie dirigiu, em parceria com as Nações Unidas, um projeto voltado para a erradicação da poliomielite. Ele convidou o fotógrafo brasileiro Sebastião Salgado, que ajudou a contar por meio das fotos as histórias de pessoas afetadas pela doença. The idea was to use the online to do things differently than you could do it on paper and also to collaborate with human rights groups. So we worked with um, UNICEF, World Health Organization, um, several, uh, Rotary Centers for Disease Control with Sebastião Salgado to try to end polio worldwide. So we, we made a big exhibition at the United Nations. We made books uh, online. And at that time, there was about 80 people getting polio every year, and we were trying to make it zero. So it's a good thing to try to stop a disease around the world. So I'm always interested, how do you do things differently uh, that are good, not, not the bad stuff, but the good stuff, using media, you know, to do something that's more interesting. So a lot of the projects that I do are projects that try to share the power. So it's not the outside person deciding, but it's the inside people who do it. There's an interesting project by a Dutch photographer, Jan Hook, and he was interested in Africa, the Maasai people, because the image we have of them is as tribal people jumping, but a lot of them live in cities. So he said to them, how do you want to be photographed? And they would tell him, and then he would make the images, and they'd say, this is my first choice picture, my second choice picture. I don't want to be shown as tired. I don't want to be shown nude. I don't want to be shown lazy. So I'll choose my images. And at the end of it, he asked 50 Maasai people to vote on the best image of the Maasai. So he's asking the people to determine how they want to be shown because he's from Holland, he doesn't know very much to, to make the decision. So what I'm looking for is if there's a revolution, it's not just about buying a new computer or a new camera, it's about being revolutionary and you're thinking about media, who has the power, who doesn't have the power, how can we change that, how can we do it differently? And sometimes, you know, if I, if I made a photograph of a very rich person, I may think it's amazing, and then they look at it and they say, this is wrong. You know, you learn something, uh, if it's a poor person, a rich person, you learn when you collaborate. You just don't tell people who they are, you ask them who they are. O último livro de Fred Ritchie, publicado em 2013, tratou dos impasses do fotojornalismo atual. Até onde vai a credibilidade das imagens? Como confiar no que nossos olhos veem através das telas? If I want to go to a restaurant 
and I arrive in Rio, I'm going to ask somebody I know and say, what's a good restaurant? I'm not going to go to just any restaurant, usually. Somebody will say, that's a good restaurant. So I trust them, and I go. So if I want to know what's happening in the world, I'll go to a newspaper, a TV, some, an organization that I trust, and they'll tell me this is what's happening. I may not agree, I may look at another source or a third source and compare. So one says this, one says that, and so on. But those organizations have a responsibility to make sure that what they're publishing is not fake. It's like with a doctor. A doctor has an obligation to do the right thing for the patient. They can't just do anything. So we have to have some sense of what it is to be professional. If we only look at images or text that we agree with, then we're lost because we don't learn anything. We're not in the world. You know, we just want what we want. And that becomes like consumerism. I go to the store, I only want, you know, a bathing suit that's red or whatever you want. You, okay, you're, you're buying a bathing suit, no problem. But I can't go to the newspaper and say, I only want my point of view reflected. So we need a lot of work on media literacy for children, for adults, like how to do that. But I think the, the point is, it's not just all opinion. There are realities out there. You can't just make them up. And, you know, the question eventually is, are there any legal ways to prosecute people who make it up? You know, what's going on? And in the United States, it's, you know, they just published in the Washington Post uh, in the last two days uh, that quite possibly Hillary Clinton would have won the election, that somehow 4% of people who might have voted for her were convinced by fake news not to vote for her. And that's the end of democracy. There's no democracy. Then you have a dictator if it falls apart. Yeah, certainly the mainstream media doesn't know everything. And if I want to know about nuclear energy, I want scientists to tell me about nuclear energy, not just mainstream media and so on and so forth. You know, but it, it can't just be, uh, you know, that just an opinion all the time that people go for. All this is very new. Social media is just a few years old. We don't really know what we're doing yet in it. The study shows that fake news are more popular than actual news, but I also find that in conversations, the people with the loudest voice, the people who hate, the people who are angry, they often attract a lot of attention. It's not necessarily reasonable. The, the metaphor I use is we're in a boat. The boat has a hole. We have to fix the hole. I'm not interested if you like the boat, you don't like the boat, we have to fix the hole. That's it. And if we cannot do that as a society, we drown. When I started writing about uh, digital imaging being manipulated, I wrote in 1984 for the New York Times Sunday Magazine. There's 1.6 million copies. And I said, we're gonna have a big problem in the future if we don't think about this. So that is 34 years ago I wrote about it. That was about six years before Photoshop. It was just big machine, you know, just very expensive ways of doing it. But I showed people like, you can change images, and what are we gonna believe in the future? And for the most part, we did nothing as an industry. And I think that was a huge mistake that we did nothing. I, for example, said you have to put a symbol next to the image that if it's been manipulated, so people know they could click on the symbol and see how it's manipulated. People said, no, we're not interested. Well, now I think we really have to face it because otherwise uh, there's no reality through media. We just don't know what's real, what's not real. And that's not helpful at all. When you read a text, you know it's written in Portuguese and Spanish. And if you don't read Portuguese, you understand it's different culture. In photography, we think it's a universal language. It's not a universal language. It's actually different. You read it differently in different countries. The same image in Mexico is different, can be read differently in Brazil or differently in South Africa or wherever it would be. Um, so we need the media literacy to see it's, it's different. But what I'm very happy about is that the global photographers are all contributing and many, many more are now being appreciated. When I did the exhibition of Latin American photographers, contemporary Latin American photographers. I think it was 1987 in New York. At the Museum of Modern Art in New York, there was in the collection, there was only two Latin American photographers. 
It was Martin Chambi from Peru and Alvarez Bravo from Mexico, nobody else. Um, and it was not known then at the time. And now it's completely different. Latin American photographers are being shown everywhere, all over the place, um, with an enormous success and uh, a lot of appreciation. So I think these are good things. Um, and, you know, in, in that sense, I think the revolution has happened there that the global uh, south, the north, we're all contributing to the imagery of the world at this point, um, and we're all being heard and listened to and seen. The problem is, for the most part, we don't know how to read each other's images so well. That's where we need interpretation, we need criticism, we need curating um, as well. But I think it's, in that sense, there's a lot of energy. It's very lively. There's a lot of possibility, and, and there's also a lot of hope, which is, at this point in the world, it's very important to have a lot of hope.